and seasonably warm temperatures are expected in parts of the plains, causing major concerns about some of the nation's winter wheat crop. Purdue University's president is calling on leaders to push back on the attacks on GMO technology. We'll discuss the reasons for these attacks and the results of a new study from university researchers. I'm Charles Denny. Songwriting and science, the two blend together here at the University of Tennessee Ag Campus. We'll meet the prof who combines plants and guitars coming up. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Market Day Report. I'm Casey Mason. We have some important news for America's dairy producers. The USDA says things are expected to remain relatively steady through 2016 for the dairy industry. RFD-TV's Janet Ackeson has more on the story. After years of record high feed prices, dairy farmers are seeing lower grain costs, but the positives are being offset by other problems, including lower milk prices. In 2015, U.S. milk production increased by 2.6 billion pounds, while the all milk price settled in at an average of 1708. For 2016, it's expected to average between 1530 and $16 per hundredweight. That, combined with a reduction in U.S. dairy exports, has USDA predicting a year of status quo for dairy farmers. So right now we're not really expecting any large herd expansion or herd contraction. Uh, matter of fact, uh, projections for 2016 are a slight herd contraction, um, but we did see some decreases in the most recent milk production report showing lower cow numbers from the month before. Overall, experts say things will hold relatively steady both herd-wise and price-wise. The cheaper grain prices will help the milk feed ratio, thus keeping the margins better than they would have been a year ago with a dollar-plus drop in the all-milk price. In Washington, D.C., I'm Janet Atkinson, RFD TV News. Well, according to the January Consumer Price Index, fresh whole milk for the first month of 2016 was down more than 7% from January 2015. All right, well, Purdue, Purdue University President Mitch Daniels is calling on leaders well, to push back on the attacks on GMO technology. President Daniels joins us live today by the phone to talk a little bit more about GMOs and food security today. Good morning, President Daniels, and thank you so much for joining us on our Market Day Report today. Casey, Indiana's proud of you. We know we'll take you back anytime. That's right, actually, and I'm from the Hoosier State, so this is my second time interviewing you. It's so great to talk with you again today from the Hoosier State. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. Uh, what is at stake with respect to GMO technology exactly, and really why is the technology under attack? What's at stake is the survival, literally, of millions of our uh, brothers and sisters around the world, predominantly in poor countries. Uh, what we know from history and what we know from um, a look at the, the uh, magnificent new technologies under development uh, here at Purdue and so many other places is that uh, as, as mankind, humankind has in the past, we can feed um, growing numbers of people and feed them better than ever before. But uh, we, will, we can't do it if, if for no good scientific reason uh, the research on which uh, higher yields, not to mention more environmentally safe ways of producing the new food we need, are, uh, are stifled. Let's go into that a little bit more in depth. I mean, why are GMO foods better for consumption and the environment? Well, first of all, we know uh, emphatically they're safe. There have been two to three trillion, trillion meals now eaten involving GMO foods, and it hasn't been a single a problem. Regulators all over the world have studied uh, them uh, uh, with, if anything, ex excessive rigor and care, and and uh, in every single case found them safe. And uh, uh, so that question uh, uh, really is is resoundingly decided as anything in in the in the, in the world of science. And um, plus, they just offer so many so much potential foods that are more nutritious, foods that. Uh, help the body's immune system, foods that uh, can uh, uh, help us uh, uh, weigh less and, and be uh, uh, healthier even as we, as we consume them. So um, there's, there really is a, the next great leap is, uh, is within our reach, but uh, if we don't achieve it, it'll be a self-inflicted wound, and that would be tragic, in fact, morally uh, mm -hmm. unacceptable. Um, if people in the wealthy countries said to people in the poorer countries, uh, sorry about your luck. 
All right. Uh, President Daniels, uh, there at Purdue University, you guys just finished a study on what would happen if GMOs are banned. What exactly did that research find? Well, it's just the latest in so many uh, looks that have been taken at this, but it found, and this is not new, that if we uh, were to succumb to the uh, superstition or junk science that would actually uh, deny humankind these technologies, first thing that would happen is food would cost an awful lot more. But the next, the next thing would happen would be significant environmental damage. It would take a lot more land, as your listeners know, to produce the food we need. It would take more water than the crops of tomorrow necessarily will take. It'll take more pesticides and herbicides than the than the uh, resistant uh, strains we can develop uh, will require. And the and the additional finding was that it would generate a substantial increase in the CO2 emissions as you used all that extra land uh, to uh, to produce the necessary crops. Something like 17 percent more CO2 than, agri than that agriculture would otherwise produce. So uh, for those whose first concern is, is CO2 emissions and their effect on climate, the, this would be a very big step backward. All right, and finally, President Daniels, what effect, if any, will the Senate panel passage of the bill to block state labeling of GMO foods have across the board, in your opinion? Well, it's an important protection. You know, this is uh, this is a tactic that, we, that has been seen in other contexts than agriculture or food. Um, if you don't have a good uh, case uh, uh, that can convince a national legislature or a re national regulator, go see if you can pick off a few states and make it impossible to do business as, as uh, producers of food have to somehow come up with a, a different label for every locality. And uh, so just as in many other cases, our national uh, Congress charged under the Constitution with, with uh, creating national uh, uh, markets and economy uh, has stepped in to preempt such action, and let's hope they do here too. All right. Well, it was a pleasure speaking with you again today, President Mitch Daniels of Purdue University. I, nice speaking with you again on our Market Day Report. We appreciate it. Thanks, Casey. Well, switching gears now, once again in the Great Plains, there are major concerns about winter wheat. And as we hear from Rod Bain, unusually warm temperatures are expected in the region, which could spell bad news for the important crop. A break in record-setting warmth in the central U.S. closed out February and welcomed in March. As USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey notes, On leap day, February 29th, we actually picked up some significant accumulating snow in the Dakotas and leap day records for snowfall were set in South Dakota locations. However, a shift in the jet stream this weekend is expected to bring warmth back to the Great Plains. Besides melting those Dakota snow accumulations, Rippey says it again exposes winter wheat in the plains to potential freeze events. All of that warmth has helped to coax winter wheat out of dormancy across the southern half of the Great Plains and has caused the winter wheat crop to lose winter hardiness in the northern portions of the plains. It's been a while since we had any widespread snow cover across the Great Plains, so as we move into spring, we are really going to have to watch for getting into especially late March and April for the potential for damaging freeze events if we were to get a cold outbreak across the nation's midsection. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D. And meteorologist Joe King will give us a better idea of the seriousness of the situation in the plains coming up in just a few minutes. Welcome back to the Market Day Report. I'm meteorologist Joe King, live from the Roy Rogers studio. Greetings to everyone listening around the U.S. and Canada on Sirius XM Channel 147. That's Rural Radio. Do you have the app? Get it on that phone. A lot of our farmers and ranchers listening while they're out on their farm operations. Here's a look at our current temperatures, and it's going to dictate where that snow is sitting. We're seeing snow this morning in through the Great Lakes and the Upper Plains. Meanwhile, a chance at scattered thunderstorms through the southeast, and we're going to talk about some very wet and warm conditions into the west coast. And this is more specifically for our ag communities through Minnesota, Wisconsin, the Great Lakes, and even through the New England states. We still have some ice 
icy ponds on some of our farms. But that's going to start to dissipate here with these warmer temperatures. Shallow pond ice that's melting from the bottom up might look frozen on the top, but it's not. And when in doubt, don't do it. And still, always a great reminder to have a rope, a rescue ring near as a lot of these icing ponds, especially again to the northern plains and the Great Lakes, start to uh, thin out. Our temperatures getting into the 30s. These will be high temperatures today. The extreme northern tier still in the 20s, but these 60s, 70s starting to move up and through Nebraska. Nebraska 60s through Wyoming and in through Montana. Warm temperatures. We have a large ridge out west that's allowing warm air to surge north, but keeping it very dry in through the plains. And as Rod Bain just reported, the winter wheat emerging with these warm temperatures in through especially the southern plains, very dry conditions, but it's wet towards the uh, southeast and towards the west coast. Here's system number one on shore to California. Number two is lined up to go. We'll see valley rain and upper level snow, I mean snow, measured in several feet through the Sierra Nevada and the Cascades as we get through the weekend. As we head towards the east, dry conditions and through the four corners and through Texas and a good part of the southern plains and the Midwest, you'll see sunshine and warm temperatures today. It's into the southeast. We have our low pressure system moving into Tennessee. Chance at scattered thunderstorms through Georgia and Alabama. We'll see this all as snow as we get into the Ohio Valley. No severe weather advisories are out, but it's a very cloudy, wet day with some colder temperatures, cooler temperatures in the 40s with a lot of this snow. Here's where the 30s and the 20s sit, where it's all snow through Indiana and into Ohio, through southern Michigan, and that's the way it will be heading towards the east coast with a half inch to an inch of rain by Saturday. But the larger amounts of rainfall, three to six inches, will be out to the west coast. Here's our setup as we'll see this system Saturday into California with a good chance at flooding. Drier trends through the heartland of the country, but Sunday into Monday, very wet west of the Rockies. Monday into Tuesday, we'll have the chance at severe weather transitioning into the central Mississippi Valley and holding on Wednesday from the Great Lakes into the southeast. And we've been talking about these warmer temperatures. Not good for the Alabama peach crop. More specifically, they like those chill hours, which is about a 45 degree or even lower into the 50s at the top end. Too warm for the blooms. The longer the bloom takes to come out is because it's warmer and that could lead to a longer harvest. So temperatures are still going to be warm, especially as we look to the southeast. Here's what's predicted above normal temperatures on our six to 10 day temperature outlook as we get through almost mid March. I hope you have a very safe and productive day on your farm operation. Stay with us. We have the grain and livestock update. The only place you'll get it next live with Marlon Bowling as the market day report continues. Well, thanks for joining us here on the Market Day Report. I'm Marlon Bowling with you, and uh, we are watching your grain and livestock market action. Of course, from time to time, we also like to keep an eye on the outside markets because they do tend to have a bit of an influence on our grain trade, uh, with all things uh, being quiet otherwise during the winter. Let's take a look at what's going on, first of all, in that crude oil market. See what's going on right now. Uh, sometimes that can have an impact on the ethanol industry and therefore the corn. Uh, maybe also some uh, impact on the soy oil industry because of its connection with soy biodiesel. So on the uh, crude oil market right now, what we're looking at is West Texas Intermediate Crude in the April contract on the futures is trading at 34.32. We are down 34 cents compared to yesterday's close. And it is uh, basically about 13 cents off of its earlier low today. We're off of our high by about a half a dollar or so. So that's how it stands in the crude oil market. What about the value of the U.S. dollar so far today? Well, we'll take a look at the dollar index futures for you. And the March, after uh, kind of treading water there as we got out of the overnight session, right now it's seeing weakness. We're actually down 390 points on the day so far. We're trading at 97.840. Uh, so the dollar index getting a little weak. Uh, we're actually about 100 points off of our earlier lows, but uh, actually a lot of weakness in this U.S. dollar index. We'll see if that helps prompt a little uh, export activity here on the grain side of things. Let's go to the corn market and see what's going on right now. Uh, we had the uh, export sales numbers that came out this morning from USDA, and they were pretty good on the corn, actually. They were up 18 percent from last week. But the corn is not performing very well uh, now that the numbers are out. We have the May contract currently up a penny. It's showing a last trade of 3.55 and a quarter. 
and that would be on the low of the range if you include the overnight trade. Now we have the July contract currently down three quarters of a cent and it's trading at 360 even. That would also be on the low of the uh, range going back to the overnight session. Now in the cash grain terminal markets, I was looking at USDA's printout for the corn prices around the country and it looks like the range was anywhere from basically about four cents lower to maybe three cents higher. We had the uh, biggest loss at Memphis. They went down four cents overnight. They were priced at 362 this morning. And we had Mount Olive, North Carolina going up three cents on their corn bid at 406. Meanwhile, on the soybean markets, let's go to the futures trade and uh, see how they're doing so far. The May beans currently too higher at 863 and a half, not a big gain. The range is running roughly about a nickel right now so far if you include the overnight session. July soybeans now two and a quarter higher at 870 even. If we look at the uh, cash soybean trade from the terminals around the countryside, well, we were higher anywhere from about three cents higher all the way up to 12 cents higher. So your best performer would have been Memphis going up 12 cents on their soybean price. They were priced at 8.63 this morning. And as we look at the wheat markets in Chicago wheat, uh, we'll take a peek at that May contract right now and see how it's doing. Currently, it's trading at 453. That would be two and three quarters higher. And July is two and a half higher. Now two and three quarters higher at 459. Kansas City wheat on the May contract. It has been trading higher too. We're now three and three quarters higher at 458 and three quarters. July up three and three quarters at 468 and a half. They have been concerned about uh, the wheat coming out of dormancy a little early out there in many parts of the central and southern plains. Uh, we haven't heard of any wheat joining just yet, but it's getting really close and that makes it susceptible to any cold weather snap that might come in. Uh, on the Minneapolis spring wheat trade, of course, this wheat is not planted yet, but the May is trading three and a half higher at 492. July now four higher at five dollars and a half cent. And in the cotton market, uh, we've been chopping around on both sides of unchanged. Now we have the May back up by 41 points at 56.34. That's the latest on our crop markets. We'll come back and look at your livestock trade right after this. And we're back with you on the Market Day Report. Thank you for joining us here on a Thursday. We're watching your ag commodity market action and uh, do want to review what USDA had reported for export sales on the meat side of the ledger. And actually, it was a pretty good week for the pork exports. We'll look first of all at the beef. Uh, it came in at 10,200 metric tons for the past week. Well, if you compare it to last, uh, the previous week, it was actually down 18%, but it was 2% higher, though, if you consider the four-week average. The increases in sales on the beef were reported for Japan at 5,000 tons, uh, South Korea, 1,800, Mexico, 1,700, Canada, uh, Canada rather came in to buy 700 metric tons, and Taiwan also bought 700 metric tons. Now, on the pork side, uh, this was 39% higher than the previous week at 20,000 even for the metric ton total, uh, and that would be 2% higher from the four-week average. Increases were reported for Mexico at 6,000 metric tons, South Korea 4,500, Japan 3,600, Australia came in to buy 1,800 metric tons of U.S. pork, and China bought 800 metric tons in this last go-round, according to USDA. Now, if we look at our daily livestock summary, I'll remind you that we didn't have any cash cattle activity yesterday. Looks like the asking prices are going to be around 140, and the packer bids are around 136. Where will they meet? Will it be in the middle or is uh, one going to blink first? We'll wait and see. Maybe we'll uh, get something shaking loose today. Uh, the cash hog market was a little firmer yesterday on a live basis and a carcass basis. They were anywhere from a quarter to almost a dollar higher. Let's take a look at our futures market activity here this morning. On the live cattle trade, this thing, uh, if you look at a chart, and uh, we'll pull up a chart here momentarily, the chart looks like it's been bumping its head here recently uh, against overhand resistance. Right now, April live cattle are at 135.67. And they're now 63 lower on the day. As you recall, a few days ago, we got up and uh, tested that uh, 138 mark. We got up as high as uh, 138.40, I believe it was last Friday. And, uh, and then it fell back, and it never did quite uh, test it once again. So it's kind of regrouping right now. Uh, April down 63, June down 40 at 125.52. In fact, I believe we have a, a one-year chart on the live cattle market, and uh, we can kind of see how things have been uh, performing here. Uh, you can tell we had a big dip there toward the end of the last year, but then uh, we had several good rallies in there. And uh, once again, I'll draw your attention. If you look at that uh, high way back in like last June and draw a line, diagonal line across the tops so of all those spikes going downward, 
Then, if you go toward the end of last year, when you had that bottom on the chart there, you draw a line upward across the uh, bottom there and uh, come upward. Well, those two kind of coincide roughly about where we are right now. And the analysts uh, call that a wedge formation. Some call it a coil formation where it's just uh, making uh, lower highs and higher lows and they just keep getting closer and closer together. So they're at a point where something they think should give in the trade and break out one way or the other. They're just waiting to see which way it's going to go. Feeder cattle trade uh, on the futures. Uh, we'll pull that up here momentarily. And we have the uh, April contract down 97 at 156.85, starting to see more more pressure now. We're a dollar off of our earlier high. On the lean hog trade on the futures, uh, we currently have that April contract down 67 and May is now down 40 cents at 76.50, just one tick off of its low of the day there, Casey. All right, great information. Thanks so much, Marlon. Well, a professor and nationally known researcher at UT's Institute of Agriculture says his number one hobby is also a great help in his work. Dr. Neil Stewart is brilliant in a lab, but he's also a pretty good country songwriter. Well, Charles Denny shows us this, how this blend of guitar, lyrics, teaching, and science all come together for creative outcomes. You want six pack abs? You got to be a gym rat. The lyrics are often funny and heartfelt. Dr. Neil Stewart is a professor of plant sciences at UT's Institute of Agriculture, but he also has another passion, the guitar, country music, and songwriting. Strumming and singing meets science, music to pump the mind. All butterflies and ukuleles. Yeah, I, th I think I think music music makes me a better teacher and and a better researcher, a better scientist. Because um, there there's there's a part of your brain and a part of your I don't know part of yourself that that you engage in the arts that that unless you really practice and engage it, I think it could be dormant. Dr. Stewart holds a prestigious Chair of Excellence in Plant Molecular Genetics. His work includes the study of plant cell walls and increasing the yields of switchgrass as it's converted to bioenergy. I like my old truck. Stewart says his love of music carries over to the lab. He also writes a lot of academic papers. In songwriting and grant writing, you have about three minutes to tell your story and you need a memorable hook. The other one is don't bore us, get to the chorus. And so for, the, for, the, uh, for grants, I mean, it's the same thing. You have to get to the message, the core message. I mean, what can you do that an agency would want to find? Music and science also require you to collaborate with partners. Stewart performs sometimes with 14-year-old Sydney Stennett, a Knox County High School student with a powerful and beautiful voice. Sun comes up, sun goes down, around and around. Meantime, for Neil Stewart, the music plays on, and his research and teaching accompany that. He always has science in his head and a song in his heart. This is Charles Denny reporting. Well, you can find Dr. Stewart and Sydney Stinnett's music online at ReverbDation.com. Let's get a final look at our forecast, Joe. Well, Casey, Marlon, good morning. Showers to the southeast. Could see a rumble of thunder in there. Snow through the Great Lakes, but here comes the rain to the west coast. We'll see that for Friday, tomorrow, and Saturday. Some possible flooding. Very welcome rain to the west coast, and by Sunday, we'll see that more so to the Intermountain Chain. All right, it's time to get jazz. The 2016 <laughs> Commodity Classic gets underway today in New Orleans. Mark Oppel has a live report coming up next. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on your Market Day Report. You're watching RFD TV. I'm Casey Mason. Here's some of the top stories we're working on today. Well, a German meat processor announced it will sign a deal with the Serbian government to invest in nearly $325 million in the country's pig breeding industry. Under the new agreement, the company will purchase 10 pig farms and set up a meat processing facility in the country. The project will be implemented over the next five years. 
Kraft Heinz Company is the latest to go cage-free. That's right, the company announced it will transition to using 100% cage-free eggs in all of its North American operations by 2025. Kraft Heinz products are currently in over 98% of U.S. households. A Monsanto and the American Red Cross are teaming up to give rural residents farm-focused content on their smartphones. Well, the three-year partnership will add rural safety tips to the American Red Cross First Aid app. The app is available for download at Amazon Marketplace in both the Apple iTunes and Google Play stores. So far, the app has been downloaded three million times. All right, well, every day we are learning more about the benefits of soil to healthy agriculture industry. The USDA unlocks the secrets of soil health in the second chapter of our seven-part series. There is an amazing, hidden, living kingdom beneath our feet. In fact, millions of species and billions upon billions of organisms, bacteria, algae, microscopic insects, earthworms, beetles, nematodes, ants, mites, fungi, and more reside in the soil. This life represents the greatest concentration of biomass anywhere on the planet. While scientists work to more fully understand this complex and elegant ecosystem, Many producers already know that when they farm in ways that protect and enhance the soil's microbial communities, good things happen. They understand that microbes build better soils and help make farms more profitable and resilient to weather extremes. Plus, producers who farm with soil building practices use less energy, improve water quality, and create better wildlife habitat. These soil health farmers disturb the soil as little as possible, keep the soil covered with plants or plant residues, keep living roots in the soil as much of the year as possible, and use diverse species. There are four primary conservation activities that enable farmers to achieve these principles on their farms. Planting without tilling, growing cover crops, rotating diverse crops, and grazing diverse plants. When used in systems over time, the benefits of these soil health practices can be substantial, both on and off the farm which is good for the farm, the farmer, and all of us. Well, tomorrow, farmers plant without plowing. Find out how a no-till method is benefiting soil health in part three of our video series. Well, in the year 1900, around 41% of America's workforce was employed in agriculture. By the year 2000, that number dropped below 2%. Although numbers have dropped, those involved in agriculture are as passionate today as they've ever been. Well, now that passion is showing in the younger generation, and we may even be seeing a reversal of people back into agriculture. All right, well, last week, more than 2,000 young people were at the Lamar Dixon Expo Center for the 2016 LSU Ag Center State Livestock Show. Louisiana Farm Bureau President Ronnie Anderson recognized many young 4-H members for all their hard work. Dina Crochet was among the winners this year. She's been a member of 4-H for eight years, following in the footsteps of her older brother. Well, this year, she won reserve champion with her Louisiana Red Steer. It's been an extra thing that I've done, but by far this is what I live for and this is my favorite thing to do. I couldn't really imagine my life without 4-H or FFA. Um, I guess I would focus more on sports, but to picture a life not being raised in a household that's based around agriculture would be unimaginable. Well, more than 250 state champions were named in its state this year's state livestock show. Well, one of the largest convention facilities in the entire nation is packed to the brim with all things agriculture for the 2016 Commodity Classic. Nearly 8,000 farmers and ranchers are in New Orleans to discover new products and technology. Today, RFD-TV's Mark Oppel joins us there live with a special guest. Good morning, Mark. 
Thank you very much, Casey. Again, uh, as we come to you from the 2016 Commodity Classic, you know, back in 1996, Corn Growers, Soybean Association, and the Wheat Growers all got together. They were having separate conventions that, you know, we ought to get together. A lot of our members go to the conventions of their choice, and we don't always get the attendance we'd like. So they came together about 20 years ago. Then four or five years ago, sorghum producers joined Commodity Classic. And this year, another new member, the Association of Equipment Manufacturers. And we have their senior vice president joining us here on this edition as we come live, Charlie O'Brien. Charlie, welcome to Commodity Classic and welcome to RFD TV. Thanks, Mark. Great to be here. Good to have you here. Why Commodity Classic? I guess that would be a question that we would ask leading things off. Yeah, well, we had we had had our Ed Connect show for several years, and then our members, the, the equipment manufacturers, say, you know, Commodity Classic is also a great venue, and so we had a lot of similarities in terms of our philosophies on how to run a show, have a very professional environment. So our, our members suggested, you know, why don't, why don't we see if we can't get together and talk and see if it makes sense for us to, as equipment manufacturers, talk to Commodity Classic and get, get see if we can't get something together and make, it, make one plus one equals three. And so, mm -hmm. so we, we started those talks probably about three years ago now. And the more we talked, the more we thought, you know, it makes a lot of sense. And from our, from our members' perspective, it was all about, you know, these are, these are really important customers to us, and can we do something e even bigger at the show? So, so we talked and, and got together. So what, let's talk about the marketplace overall. You've got uh, 450 members that are ag-connected in their manufacturing. Talk about the marketplace. Yeah, the marketplace, is, I mean, it's been an interesting dynamic. So not too long ago, the marketplace was, was on fire, you know, quite mm -hmm. frankly. And there was a lot of equipment that was being sold. And then um, through the 20, 2010 and 2013, and then all of a sudden, you know, kind of the bottom dropped out a little bit. And as you know, commodity prices did what they did and dropped a great deal. And as a result of that, equipment sales also took a very uh, deep dive. And I think, I think the surprise about it, not that it was a um, that it was going up and down, because we certainly have a, a very cyclical business, but I think it was how steep and how quickly the uh, downturn happened. And I think, and quite frankly, a lot of members weren't quite ready for that. And um, but now, having you know, last year and now this year, you know, I think budgets have been adjusted. And as a result of that, I think there's an expectation where the market is trying to find out w where the the uh, new normal is at this point in time, and with the current prices as they are from a commodity price perspective. So I think there's an expectation that you know this year will probably be uh, maybe even a little bit down in some of the sectors compared to last year, but but we're starting to see a little bit of a leveling out, which is a good thing Very overall. Good. Mm -hmm. Real quick, uh, just wrapping things up, uh, rural broadband was on your list of things, and real quick, and that's uh, important to RFD TV, no doubt. We talk about it a lot. How does yeah. that fit in with the uh, AEM? Well, we've been working very hard in terms of uh, convincing people how important broadband is for the equipment. And when you talk to the um, the people that are in charge of broadband, getting into rural America, they always talk about hospitals and they always talk about libraries and getting broadband there, which is extremely important. However, when you talked about machine to machine communications and all the technology mm -hmm. that's available, machines have to be able to talk to each other and they're not necessarily in town, they're on the back 40. And so we're, we're trying to convince people to, you know, we need broadband, we need it everywhere so that our equipment can, can be used the way it's designed. So we're working very hard on that. Technology is in, on display here big time at Commodity Classic. Let Absolutely. me say welcome to the uh, Association of Equipment Manufacturers, year one here at Commodity Classic. Yep, great to be here, Mark. Thank you. Charlie O'Brien, their senior vice president, year number one here, so history making today here at the Commodity Classic. Casey, back to you. Great reporting, Mark. Thanks so much. Well, the event runs through March 5th and features 355 companies exhibiting in more than 170,000 net square feet of booth space. To learn more, download the Commodity Classic mobile app and continue to watch Market Day Report for more live reports. And keep it right here. Meteorologist Joe King has your forecast at 40 past the hour. Happy Thursday morning on this March 3rd. I'm meteorologist Joe King, where we're seeing snow to the Great Lakes. Going to have a dry midsection of the country, a wet west coast, and a lot of rain headed towards the southeast. We could see some embedded thunderstorms. Low pressure system is getting in through the southeast, and what we'll see is the transit, some heavy rainfall for the lower Mississippi Valley along the southeast coast, and that will push later tonight into the North Carolina coast region. And it's all rainfall for our farmers in through northern Mississippi. 
Mississippi. Northern Alabama has seen some stronger storms and that's transitioning into northern Georgia. As we get to the north of this system, this is the Cumberland Plateau through eastern Tennessee. Quick transition into snowfall, but it's all rain in through Nashville and points westward and that will include southern Illinois. Scattered showers now dissipating with cloud cover in through Missouri, but to the north of that, that's snow and it's for our uh, farmers in through Ohio again through Indiana. Northern Indiana seen quite a bit of snow and we'll see this also head to the east with some winter weather advisories already posted a uh, winter storm warnings in through Roanoke. So we could see some possible eight plus inches in through uh, the fields of Virginia to the northeast. Calm trends cold. We have wind chill advisories in through Maine. Very cold Canadian air still hovering around the Great Lakes. That's snow through Elkhart, Indiana through South Haven, Michigan and to Grand Rapids. Scattered snow showers coming from the north northwest. That's a strong wind through Rochester and getting in through our, our dairy fields in through uh, Wisconsin. So very cold trends to the north northern plains Great Lakes, but it is rainfall valley level rain upper level snow and a lot of it is on the way. This is just day one of what will be a weekend event. Snowfall will be measured in the feet through the Sierra Nevada range and we could get a foot of rainfall in through northern California. Flooding is going to be an issue this weekend. Very welcome rain with our drought, but as it uh, comes across the Cascades and into the Rockies, things are stalling out. Very dry trends right now to the southeast, uh, southwest and in through Texas. Snowfall amounts not as significant in through uh, this is through Saturday morning through the upper plains will taper off, but here's some of those heavier snow bands getting into Virginia today where again we could see six to eight inches pretty easy and some six foot inches a half foot of snow in through northern Indiana half inch to an inch of rainfall up in the east coast but three to six inches. This is just through Saturday morning in through the California coast. So this is our setup, the low pressure system tomorrow off the east coast. But here we'll get into the west coast on Friday and for Saturday, a chance at flooding heavy rain showers, especially for northern California. That will expand more on Sunday, getting for our farmers in through Utah and through Nevada. Windy trends through the Midwest. And here we go again on a Tuesday. The past couple Tuesdays, we've had a chance at severe weather through the central Mississippi Valley. It'll be that way again this Tuesday and possible Wednesday severe thunderstorms. So our temperatures warm out west 50s and 60s up through Nebraska, Montana, Idaho, 70s and 80s to the uh, Texas and the West Coast 30s by Friday. Tomorrow will you be your highs with scattered snow showers through the Great Lakes, but still very warm temperatures in those 60s pushing 70s in through Kansas. I hope you have a fantastic Thursday on your farm operation. Marlin Bowling is back. We're going live to Chicago for the CME as the Market Day Report continues next. We're back with you on the Market Day Report. Thank you for joining us today. It's a Thursday and we're watching your grain and livestock market action. And we have a few things coming up on the uh, calendar that I want to make sure you're aware of. Uh, of course, this morning we got the new export sales numbers from USDA. And then uh, coming up on Monday, we're going to get the export inspections version of that to find out uh, what actually left the borders as far as exports. And then uh, coming up next week on the 8th, don't forget your uh, March cotton contracts will be going off the board next week. So uh, that's coming up very soon here. And then we get a big crop production and supply and demand report on the 9th next week. That'll come out at 11 o'clock in the morning, central time. And uh, that will be uh, a potential market mover. However, analysts have been telling me, by the way, that they think we could get more of a kick out of the report that comes out at the end of the month. And that will be the big prospective plannings report when uh, USDA gives an updated guess on what the planted acreage will be for different crops. Uh, March 13th begins daylight saving time. Man, it's almost here already. And uh, the cattle on feed report is going to be coming out on March 18th. And also, uh, spring will be beginning officially on March 20th of this month. So it's not that far away. Uh, and uh, they can't bring it on fast enough for a lot of folks. Now, uh, we had some new ethanol numbers that had come out recently, too, as far as the ethanol production this uh, past week. And the numbers showed that we had 987,000 uh, barrels per day for production. That was down 7,000 barrels per day from the previous week when we had 994,000. But you have to keep in mind that last week happened to be a six-week high. So uh, that was a pretty good number to be compared against. And in fact, uh, last week's ethanol production did outpace our four-week average, which was at 981,000 for the past four weeks. 
So pretty good production all in all for the uh, ethanol in the U.S. here this past week. Keep in mind the ethanol stocks did decline. They were down to 22.6 million barrels this time around. And for the 11th week in a row, zero imports of ethanol into the U.S. Let's take a look at our futures trade here on the corn market so far this morning. Uh, the export sales uh, reported uh, earlier by USDA were okay. They were pretty good. Over a million metric tons, in fact, 1.1 million. But the corn uh, didn't get much of a kick out of that number. We have the May corn currently down three quarters at 355 and a half. And the, the uh, trading range, I was looking at May here, and those of you viewing at home can uh, see this as well. The high was 357 and a half if you go back to the overnight session, and our low today, only 355. So this same uh, trend continues here where the markets just continue to be uh, very range-bound, very quiet, and they just continue to drift a little lower as we go. The uh, July corn currently down a half cent at 360 and a quarter, so just almost dead in the water here. December new crop corn is now coming in at 374 and three quarters, and uh, that would be just one tick higher on the day. This market is like it's falling asleep. Now, if you look at the soybean trade, here on the soybean futures, we have May up a half at 862, and we have the uh, September contract back to unchanged at 871. That's on the low of the range of the day there. Meanwhile, on the wheat trade, we have had some firmness creeping in here. We have had short covering entering the wheat market lately because it was so severely oversold. Uh, May Chicago wheat up four and three quarters. New crop July up four and a quarter at 460 and a half. Kansas City wheat on the May were up five and three quarters. We have July new crop five and a half higher at 470 and a quarter. And in Minneapolis spring wheat, well, we have the May four and a quarter higher and July up four and a quarter at five bucks and three quarters of a cent. Meanwhile, on the cotton market, uh, we have been bouncing around on both sides of unchanged May. Now 22 points higher at 56.15 on the day. That's the latest on our crop markets. We're going to come back and analyze your livestock trade when we come back after this. Back with you on the Market Day Report. Thank you for joining us today on a Thursday. I'm Marlon Bowling with you, and we're going to take a look at our livestock trade. I do want to take a look at some background information right now as far as what occurred uh, affecting the uh, cattle and hog markets yesterday. Now, on the cash cattle trade, if you look back at what took place yesterday, there was no activity, no volume yet, everything quiet. And uh, we are looking at packer bids. They did come in and surprise a few folks when they are uh, actually bidding 136 out there in the plains. Well, that's almost what we actually got for selling prices last week. So that was a bit of a surprise. The asking prices at the feedlot level this week are uh, appearing to be around 140. I have heard some rumors maybe up as high as 142, but uh, it looks like the majority will be around that 140 mark. And we'll see if they can come together at some point here today. In the meantime, on the cash hog trade yesterday, we were a little firmer. Uh, they firmed up on the live hog basis and also on the carcass basis. And uh, both of those categories were up anywhere from about 25 cents to not quite a dollar higher yesterday. That was out in the Midwest. And once again, no change at all in the price of the eggs in the New York egg market yesterday. Everything holding steady once again. This thing hasn't changed for like two or three weeks now. The extra large class is running 105 to 109. Larges are still 103 to 107. The uh, USDA weekly sheep market here nationwide this week has been running steady to maybe three bucks uh, lower. Uh, the range of trade was 140 to 182. Meanwhile, in the dairy market, on the April contract on your Class 3 milk, we actually gained six cents yesterday. The average price worked out to 13.39 per hundredweight. Now let's look at our futures and on the live cattle trade. Here we go with a look at the nearby April contract. A lot of weakness showing up here today. Uh, the April is trading at 135.47, so we're almost a dollar off of our earlier high of the day. We're about 30 cents from our low of the day and currently down 83 from where we settled yesterday afternoon. Meanwhile, the June is trading 52 lower at 125.40 on the day. August now 30 lower at 121 even. Again, we're keeping an eye on that spread between the April and the June contract, which is still running basically $10 apart. Uh, somewhere along the line, they'll have to really narrow that up. The uh, June is at about a $10 to $11 discount to the cash market so far. Let's go to the uh, feeder trade. And right now on the feeders, we have the March contract down 75. Last trade, 157.55. Now you have your April down a dollar even. We're trading at 156.82 on the day. That's about a half a dollar off of our earlier low from this morning. Uh, right now, if you compare it to the high of the day, we're off about a little over a dollar right now. 
the uh, May contract is down 78 cents. So the April contract is leading the way down so far in the futures trade this morning. And again, we'll see if any cash cattle trade does develop. Had a real interesting uh, beef cutout trade yesterday, according to USDA. Look at this spread change. We had choice cuts going up $1.90 yesterday. Selects were down $1.04. So that changed almost $3 in the spread between those two just yesterday. We'll get an update here in about an hour. Uh, let's take a look at the lean hog futures right now. And on the big board, we have the uh, April contract down 67. At 69.38, the weakness continues. May is now down half a dollar. Last trade there, 76.40. June down 40 cents. Lean hogs lower all across the board right now, Casey. All across the board. All right, thanks so much, Marlon, keeping bet. us up to date. All right, well, the American Angus Association is the nation's beef registry association with more than 30 thousand members. Well, today, James Coffey of Branch View Angus in Houstonville, Kentucky, joined us all the way here in Nashville, Tennessee, at our Roy Rogers studio to join us on our Market Day Report. Good morning. Glad to be here. We're happy to have you. So, uh, yeah, let's talk about what exactly is going on right now in the American Angus Association. Well, we just got back. I just got back from the uh, February board meeting in St. Joseph, Missouri, and in November, the association just hired a new CEO, Alan Michigimba. It's much easier to say than it is to spell. <laughs> but sad. Alan's been with us since November. Uh, he's told us how many flights he's been on. He's been on like 40-some flights since uh, since November. He's crisscrossing the country, talking to commercial producers, talking to Angus producers, talking to board members, trying to develop a grassroots up uh, point, a point of direction for the Angus Association. So Alan's doing a fabulous job. Also, several months ago in uh, a subsidiary of the American Angus Association, Angus Genetics, Inc., uh, hired a new president, Dan Mosier. Dan and his team are constantly working on uh, advancing the accuracy and options of genetically testing Angus cattle. Uh, it's, it's definitely the wave of the future. Uh, the cattle, uh, there's commercial tests, Zoetis and GeneSeq came out with cheaper tests last year, which made it more affordable for Angus cattle to be genomically tested. The genomic test uh, increased the accuracies of registered cattle, and it also provides a comparable number for commercial breeders for their females if they wanted which heifers to select for replacements in their herd or for the steers that they might want to feed out. So the, the, the genomic tests are very helpful in that and, and the acceptance rate is going through the roof. It's very, very uh, becoming more mainstream now. So uh, a lot of exciting things going on at AGI right. and uh, American Angus Association. One thing too about the Angus Association, there's four subsidiaries that a lot of people don't realize. There's Angus Genetics, there's the uh, Angus Media and the Angus Foundation, and then probably the most re worldwide recognized brand is Certified Angus Beef, which is uh, served in a lot of the finest restaurants around the world. So uh, a lot of good things going on at the Angus Association. I'd say so. Very busy now. Uh, while we do have you here today, I do want to ask uh, quickly before we wrap up, you know, um, tell us a little bit about the history of Branch View Angus. And we do know that you have a big event coming up as well. So let's yep. hear a little bit about that. Yep, we sure do. April 9th will be our 11th annual production sale. Uh, well, this year, for the last five years, we've had... The, we've hosted the largest Angus sale in Kentucky. We've sold, uh, this year will be 350 head. Wonderful. We'll be selling 100 bulls, 85 uh, females, and then uh, the balance will be commercial females. So it'll be the largest Angus sale in Kentucky, and all that information is available on our website, branchviewangus.com. There, that's my next question for you, and where people could find that information. So a lot of, obviously, things going on this year. Very busy, as well as the association keeping busy and keeping us up to date. We appreciate it today. James Coffey, thank you so much for joining us, the American yeah. Angus Association board member. And keep it right here on your Market Day Report. We'll be right back with more news, markets, and your forecast straight ahead.